So, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the today's presentation in our series on uh, risk and uncertainty. As you know, the United Nations University, together uh, with the Center for Development Research, is now since for roughly one year carrying out a series on risk and uncertainty where we are aim uh, to bring some of the most distinguished researchers and experts on uh, risk, questions of risk and uncertainty uh, here to the University of Bonn to discuss with us uh, their themes. As you, know, as you know, we had in this series already uh, researchers uh, such as uh, Francis Stewart in the first uh, presentation, or uh, Mohamed Younes, uh, the uh, Nobel laureate uh, last year. This time, I'm very happy that we got here, uh, Audrey uh, Wren, and uh, uh, I think many of you already uh, know Audrey Wren. He's perhaps in Germany one of the most uh, distinguished uh, experts on risk, and he just published a book, which is called Risk Covenant, and just also see it here already in the audience, is somebody uh, had it with him. So uh, he published this earth, and it's one of the, um, I wouldn't say Bibles, but I think of one of the key uh, 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 works uh, on uh, risk uh, in the last years. Uh, uh, Professor Orfin Ren, he's now working on risk since about 30 years, uh, when I'm right. And you studied your career, I think, close to born in Cologne. Mm -hmm. You studied uh, e economics as well as sociology uh, here uh, in Cologne. Was it at the time of René König? I yes. Just say, yes. I think it was yeah. René yeah. König, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, great uh, professors on sociology here uh, in Cologne. And then you had many, uh, then you, then you, many uh, positions in your career. You went to Switzerland, uh, to the States, of course, uh, here in Germany, and he is now with the University of Stuttgart, and I think you got there, uh, you also established uh, several centers that I just like, uh, would, uh, just to mention. On the one hand, uh, the uh, Research Institute Dialogic, which is, an, uh, 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 which is one research institute which is fairly large, I think, with about 30 uh, people in this institute. You are also the director of the Interdisciplinary Institute on Risk and uh, Sustainable Technology uh, Development, and you are a <coughs> professor for uh, sociology on, of environment and technology. Uh, and besides, you are sitting in a lot of uh, councils, and I don't have to mention them at all, because I sent out today an email where I was already mentioning the councils in which you are sitting. Uh, and you publish, I think, about 30 books, mostly on risk. So I think he is a specialist for risk, and we are very happy to have you here. Um, before we do the, the, your presentation, I just would like to tell you how we will continue. First, the presentation of uh, Orphan Wren. In the second step, then Coco Warner, where she is. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll give a, a brief a comment or, uh, from uh, her side, and afterwards we'll have a, a hopefully fruitful discussion, and I'm sure that you will come up with some, um, uh, with some ideas, uh, with uh, some arguments, which will, uh, will also stimulate the discussion we will have here. So, Otto Ren, I'm very happy that you're here. Thank you. Well, thank you first for inviting me here to. Uh, address this very distinguished audience, and I see people from many different countries here. Very pleased that so many of you showed up and to go for a lecture that is, has a dull title of Risk and Uncertainty. Uh, I hope I make it a little bit more livid through um, the lecture itself, and if there's anything that you would like to ask either in between the lecture or afterwards, I'm very happy to address your questions. I was asked to specifically focus on the issue or the kind of relationship between risk and uncertainty, and I would like to do that. Again, that is something which has a lot of conceptual kind of um, depth into it, and so I'll try also to make a few examples and just to illustrate how it's being meant, but it does have, you know, the kind of, um, um, what's it, difficulty of uh, looking into some more kind of formal things, but no mathematics here, so I'll just uh, uh, we'll stick basically to the conceptual parts. Um, so the first kind of challenge that I would like to address is the kind of issue about uncertainty, because that is a major part of what you have been interested in and also part of the lecture theories that uh, you have witnessed over the last few months. And when we look into a risk, um, my major kind of way of addressing this issue is to distinguish three types of challenges. And I should 
mention clearly that these three challenges are not part of the substance that's out there called risk, but it's the way of characterizing the knowledge that we have about risks. And when we talk about risk, what we mean is that these are consequences of activities, technologies, and events that may or may not happen in the future. So that's kind of, so we are in the art of making some kind of predictions or forecasts in a way that we can anticipate the future impacts of our own activities. So that's what we basically mean when we talk about risks. And so we deal with these three major problems. One is complexity. Risk is always based on some kind of either sequential or causal reasoning. And we're trying to define what kind of antecedents are out there that we can forecast or predict what will happen in the future. And secondly, it's very uncertain whether these things will happen. And thirdly, even if we know what happened and if you can calculate it, the interpretation may include a lot of ambiguities, meaning that we may have different ways of actually interpreting or of drawing normative conclusions from what we have discovered. Let me say a few words briefly about these three different terms because they've been defined very differently in various disciplines and also in different sections of disciplines. When I talk about complexity, I basically mean that there are a lot of intervening variables between the causal agent and its impacts. That it is very difficult to make a clear causal connection between the agent on one hand side and the consequence on the other side. We either know the consequence or we know the agent, but we have a lot of difficulties modeling what comes out of each of these and because there are so many context-related intervening variables that promote or stimulate or hinder or attenuate this type of relationship so that you need a lot of modeling but you're still not very confident whether that model really gives you a good call the picture of what you're looking at. Uncertainty is kind of the result of what comes out of this type of modeling, that you don't exactly know whatever result you have, how much confidence you can give these results in terms of what you want to describe as a phenomenon in reality. This uncertainty can have either its root in the variation among individual targets, Think about health risks, for example, if you're exposed to a specific agent or a specific exposure, many people react very differently even when you have the identical exposure. Uh, we have all the issues of measurement and inferential errors, data uncertainty, model uncertainty, paradigm uncertainties. So these are the kind of things, also all the inferential statistical <coughs> errors that you can get. We have things which we call genuine stochastic relationships. These are things where we believe that we don't find a causal connection. We find only a statistical connection between two different variables. Whether that's part of nature, whether it's part of our lack of knowledge, that's a different question. And lastly, which is, I think becomes even more important in recent days, is that we always think in terms of system boundaries. So we look at causal models. Uh, we have to somehow simplify the picture. We have to take out some of the things that may be interesting, but we cannot cover everything at the same time. But how to define these system boundaries and how to define the areas in which we have not the right knowledge or know we don't have the knowledge is, I think, quite crucial in determining the various impacts that we are looking at. And lastly, ambiguity. I think that's something that basically I want to introduce into the debate. It's not always in there. Uh, we see that very often, even if you have an agreement on the model, if you have an agreement on model parameters and on the results, we still don't agree what it means. Uh, it's just like, you know, the glass is half full and half empty. Or if I'm a social scientist, I say every second marriage in Germany is unhappy, then I say marriage is not a very good thing. If I say, you know, one of two marriages is very happy and people live happily together. You say, oh, that's a good model. Um, now, it's the same, of course, exactly the same way of doing it. And because it's a framing effect, I'll get back to this. So ambiguity is always part of it. And the ambiguity is even greater when we look into normative conclusions in which we say, for example, should be 
uh, ban passive smoking. Now we have very different policies all over Europe and all over the world about passive smoking. Everybody knows what it does. And there's hardly any uncertainty at this point about you know what are the health impacts. It's also not totally complex. Yet there's an issue whether we should ban it or not. This is an issue of what kind of values you want to have. If you have a more patronizing government or more government that says if you want to kill yourself, that's up to you. But passive smoking, of course, uh, kills all the others. So this is an issue where you can debate forever. So that's the kind of normative conclusions you can draw from interpreting results. And we see this very, very often. That's the issue of framing, which I said in the beginning. Well, how is the problem being framed? And the issue of how the results are being interpreted are more often the reason for conflict than the actual assessment or uncertainty characterization process. Now, let me say a little bit more about risk and uncertainty as some kind of a conceptual note. Um, as I said, uh, easy, kind of easy, are linear relationships. They do exist. And everything is linear if you don't wait long enough. Um, I mean, in, in, in small increments, everything is linear. And that's a part in which we have behaved very often, that we've looked into linear relationships for two or five years, they look very linear, uh, and now we extrapolate it for 50 years, and of course it's not linear. Mm -hmm. Because in general, as long as we are within a very confined time space, it's, everything looks linear. If you go beyond that time space, maybe of two, three, five years, depending on what you're looking for, it, it starts not to become linear. And we have hardly any trend that linear if you go beyond 50 years. So I think that's an important aspect, but there are a lot of problems where we can apply linear relationships because we're only interested in a very short-term forecast. And there needs to be some plausible connection between cause and effect. Bicycling would be a very good example. Uh, if you fall you know, from your bicycle, it's very clear. Well, you didn't have the right balance. Um, there's an energy for you falling down. How about the energy is in your head? The other half on the ground. And then uh, the resulting wound is uh, what is very clear. Um, there is a symmetry between explanation and prediction. You can explain it. You can also predict it for the future. Um, there is not a lot of intervening variables there. Um, and there are very stable context conditions. And normally, we have a normal distribution of aleatory elements of prediction. When we talk about aleatory uncertainty, we mean basically random variation. So we have a wonderful Gaussian, beautiful um, distribution um, uh, function there. And normally, you know, if you take bicycle accidents, you can use these types of you know, simple mathematical uh, tool to find out how many bicycle accidents you'll have, how many people are getting injured, you know, what kind of injuries will they have, and what can you do also to prevent it. So this is what we call a very simple when we look into a more complex relationship, then the cause and effect requires modeling because the cause and effect is not obvious. And if you look into a lot of issues like health issues, which I think are very prominent here, you can see, well, if you look at somebody who has cancer, you're not knowing immediately where that cancer comes from. Now, it could come from smoking, it could come from nutrition, it could come from environmental pollution, it could come from just genetic propensity, and all of that will somehow apply. So it's very difficult to do that just by looking at it. That's different from the bicycle accident. Um, so you need something like a model, and a model basically is um, a structuring of reality by abstracting from all the things that are not important. So a model is always purposeful. It's different from the model train you have, which is a depiction of a reality is small. What you really want in modeling is to have a specific purpose, for example, explaining cancer incidents. Well, there are a lot of chairs here, so you don't have to sit on the floor. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is a uh, place just over here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you normally this complex, you don't have a stable context. That means, uh, if in health modeling, you have that problem, uh, you know, people change their patterns and behaviors and different types of pollutions. Um, so you have a lot of factors to include. Another good example would be global climate change. Um, explanations ex post are always possible. That's not so difficult. Why things happened. 
or predicting is very difficult because as I said context changes and basically in that part of the claim here well you need a lot of good scientific expertise a good methodology to deal with complex phenomena uh, my belief is that evolution has not equipped us with a good sense of complexity uh, actually of certainty and ambiguity well I think intuition is sometimes pretty good but not with complexity that's why we have so many prejudices in the world. You know, people just make inferences from two or three experiences they had. It's why in the wilderness, if you think about it anthropologically, probably being quick was more important than being right. Um, well, that may be a little too flopsy in the way that I say it. But, um, but if you look in a lot of anthropological logic, you can see that you know once humans started to be in the savanna, you know, being quick was a very important element, and we see a lot of evidence of this. Now, then we look into uncertainty, and we basically have uh, divided the uncertainty in two different types of order first order uncertainty and second order uncertainty. And if you cannot resolve complexity in a full way, though, if your model does not come up with a very clear answer in terms of a cause effect chain, uh, you may have ranges of answers. And all of them may be true or not true, or you may have distributions which tell you a little more the probability distribution over a specific outcome. And uh, so we have a combination normally what we call aleatory and epistemic uncertainty. And aleatory uncertainty, again, is the random variation on a specific result. Uh, but a whole, mostly we hope that that you know, meets is a or song distribution or no distribution or binomial distribution. We have all these wonderful distributions out there that can help us to model aleatory uncertainty. Uh, but if it sometimes it doesn't, then we call the surprises or whatever, um, in which the aleatory um, uncertainty does not help us. Epistemic uncertainty is basically that we just don't know. Uh, we have good guesses or we have a whole distribution of potential answers, but we cannot tell which one is actually true. Um, it's caused by the whole set of things. Could be just lack of data or data imprecision, or you may have the kind of algorithms that we use are not really valid, uh, or they're not valid in the range that we're using. That actually one thing that happens very, very frequently also in the global climate change field that you know find something validated at a specific range, it can go a range higher or above suddenly things start to become different. Um, extrapolation methods, and hopefully we can somehow capture this by confidence intervals. And there is a possibility to characterize these types of uncertainties in a quantitative form, but they're not fully reliable. So we can say that say, the true value is between x and y is 95%. Then the second order uncertainty is very much more difficult to grasp. And that's the one where we are pretty sure that there is a causal effect, or at least a sequential effect, that all the time when we observe A, we'll see with some probability B showing up. Well, we don't know why. Oh, well, we this in the health field. We have this, uh, well, the area where you work, development. Uh, very often, there's whole, a coincidence, more or less, a and B, but we're not sure whether that's causal, whether that's a pure coincidence, or whether it's been driven by third variable. Uh, we could look at genuine stochastic relations. I talked about this already. Uh, in quantum physics, we all have that all the time. Uh, in the social sciences, we have it very often. There's no deterministic law in the social sciences. You always find at least one exception, maybe yourself. And um, so this is a philosophical question whether they exist, but in terms of our knowledge characterization, there certainly are these types of things where even if you observe it very, very carefully, we always see a range of outcomes, even if you have the absolute identical uh, uh, input. Uh, there is the system boundaries, those are limits of our observation. Uh, sometimes we look, let's say, for cancer, but actually some totally different other diseases popping up. We don't see it. Um, and we've seen this very often in terms, let's say, of the, um, uh, some of the, the medical field, um, also some of the chemicals that maybe affect fertility, um, soil hormones, for example, that have affected fertility but not affected 
for example, other types of diseases, and many people were, or many scientists were only fixed on one specific target outcome, and then did not see that the same type of substance had a lot of other negative impacts that just nobody looked at. And then, as I said, non-knowledge. Um, and non-knowledge is an interesting part. I think right now a lot of German sociologists have a high interest in this because uh, non-knowledge doesn't mean it's total ignorance. Uh, very often it means something like we know that there is something out there, but we don't know what it is. Um, or it is we know that the prices are coming up. Or we know that there are outliers in our distribution that do have some impact, but we don't know which. And maybe typical idiosyncrasies that things just happen in a sequence. And each of them has a random variation. And then, of course, if you have one, two, three, four, that variation becomes almost indefinite. Uh, that makes it more difficult. And that's why we all have biographies. Everyone is different. And that's the thing is that at least there are one, one million events with a probability of one over a million. Each of them happens more or less one. Um, what are the implications? Um, well, if you talk about policy and risk policy, there are some major implications if you think about uncertainty. Third, first, uh, trade-offs between risk and benefits are basically impossible to calculate. However, numerical estimates or characterizations are helpful to do that. Now, if I'm uncertain about specific benefits or uncertain about risks, it would be very difficult to make a cost-benefit analysis based on kind of uncertain income and outcome. Um, you can take media values or something that, you know, if the distribution differs from the benefits of the risk side, it's very difficult to say what kind of parameters you would like to do. This is really the kind of limit in which cost-benefit analysis can really make uh, very good results. Um, there are needs for advanced methods or certainty characterization. There are a lot out there that helps to characterize this type of uncertainty, this first order uncertainty. But it doesn't give you an automatic algorithm of what's good or bad. And uh, there's a need, and I'll get back to this, for robust risk management, which basically means you want to have a management that takes into account the whole probability distribution, at least to a large extent, so that you, you know, that if it's away from whatever median value you have, you'll still be able to respond properly to that kind of risk. That's different from the uncertainty second order. Where the content of trade-offs may itself be misleading. Um, if you have second-order trade-offs, meaning that you have an uncertainty that you cannot quantify, not even really characterize, but you know that they're out there, trade-offs always means that you have an incremental benefit that you can trade off against incremental risk. If you don't know your incremental risk or incremental benefit, the trade-off analysis doesn't make much sense. So that then you know, we are at the limit of doing trade-off analysis. Um, there's a need kind of to characterize the knowledge boundaries to say so far we know, beyond that we don't. And to focus on vulnerability of risk-absorbing systems, that means you shift away from the agent, if you don't know what is doing it or if you're very uncertain about it, to making our system more resilient against whatever happens. Well, that's kind of the resilience approach. And the resilience approach normally is not optimal in the economic sense. Uh, because you add extra money or extra resources for making your system more resilient than actually necessary for taking expected value approach. And of course, if you see the financial crisis, a very good example in which the system is not made resilient. Now, they didn't take the median value, they take the 95% value, but 5% times whatever, uh, 5 trillion euros. And is still a quite a lot of amount of money. Um, this is another interesting psychological fact. <coughs> we are fairly happy with probability distribution of 5% or 1% as a residual risk. And if you multiply that with a very large amount, and that is still a lot for a large amount of people. I mean, you say 95% clear that this specific <coughs> medicine will do its job in 5% that it will kill people. Well, if 80 million people take it, uh, you can see that's four million people dead. So that's yeah, that's not trivial. And sometimes the percentage is just lures into accepting something that may not be accepted. Though resilience really means that we go beyond 
uh, the residual uh, risk. Let me talk a little bit about uh, ambiguity, and then I'll go to the application of all of this. Interpretive ambiguity, I just said, is not related to factual statements, but to an interpretation with respect to value dimension. Um, one of the things that was very informative for me, I was attending a meeting of the WHO on electromagnetic fields, about some of the funds. And that was a couple of years ago. I know there was another meeting yesterday before we had a session here in Paris. But uh, this was a couple of years ago. And it, the question was, is the magnetic field, an in, is it an um, adverse effect in the sense of the WHO laws? So is it an adverse effect? If it's an adverse effect, you have to do something. Now, all the scientists out there agreed that there is an interaction between electromagnetic fields and neuron activity in your brain. That was not contested. None of them contested evidence without it is very clear that there is one. However, also there was a pretty clear agreement, at least at that meeting, that this type of activity did not show any significant increase of brain tumor. So the issue is, well, we know significant means that still a lot of people could be affected, but statistically it was not shown a significant impact of electromagnetic fields on brain damage in terms of brain tumors or other kind of uh, brain diseases above the significance level. Now, what does that mean? So, a couple of scientists there, I would say around 5%, said if there is an involuntary interaction between my neuron activity in the brain and an electromagnetic field. This is something I don't want. This is something I feel could harm myself. And that's why I call it an adverse effect. And the other 95% said, since we cannot demonstrate clear evidence that this leads to a recognizable disease, it's not an adverse effect. And the question is, what is an adverse effect became a major issue of discussion for three days. Um, because it was not quite clear, is it adverse if somebody is involuntarily somehow forced to have an interaction with some kind of outside movement at that point? Or does it have to be a recognizable disease, which has been listed in one of these, what I ICD-10 or whatever, uh, that we can then use as a reference? An issue that is still not resolved in the sense of watch the debate and uh, there's a little bit more evidence that there could be even significant impacts on brain tumor, at least for people who use the phone every minute. Um, however, it still is this issue of you know what is an adverse effect, how can we define it, and uh, you know, does it have, and now we come to normative ambiguity, some kind of inclusion or some kind of uh, implication of policy requirements that we need to associate with this kind of observed effect that we can see. And we can look into the ecotoxicology, we can look at climate change, we can look at all other things. When do we think that things happen to become a detriment, a harm? not so easy to define. So in that sense, we always have to deal with these types of ambiguities, and we can see many examples in which ambiguities have been the major fuel for conflict, rather than the actual assessment process. OK, I think we'll skip this. Um, now let me just give a little bit of uh, background how this can play out in the risk governance issue that we're talking about, the book was already mentioned, in which we're trying to develop what we call a typological model of risk governance. Um, let me first say why are we talking about risk governance in the first place, and this is a kind of conventional um, risk appraisal management system that we've dealt with. We have two different realms. One is understanding risk, then deciding on risk. 
So we appraise the risk, we communicate that to the management, and the management decides. So that's a kind of conventional, very plausible model. However, this model has a lot of problems, and because it doesn't integrate the several aspects that we think are very important, we're again relating to uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. First, well, we need a concept that link the risk assessment results of the various experts with the risk perception and social processing of risk in society. I uh, will see that a lot of people have different perceptions of risk than the so-called experts would tell them are serious or not so serious. There is a gap between the two types of assessments, the lay people's assessment, the expert assessment. Uh, that's one issue. The other issue is that very often cultures experience risk very differently. They attribute different types of emotions to one or the other or of um, risk aversion. And again, that's not irrational or something. It just means that there are different types of preferences involved in terms of how we would like to live. And there are kind of uh, two problems there. One is to say, OK, well, we only take what the scientists can calculate. And now we take a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity out of this world. And we've seen that very often that leads to disaster in terms of that the scientists are either overconfident or that the people whom they were supposed to serve will not accept this. Or the other point is that a lot of social scientists are very happy about this. And you get this very relativist view of knowledge that regardless of what you think, it's just as legitimate as what scientists have discovered. And you get to this kind of relativity of knowledge uh, claim. Yeah, any knowledge is as good as any other. And of course, in the end, you don't, cannot decide. If you have to compete in claims, you must have some kind of rule of how to select the claim that you will follow. And if you just say every claim is equally good, well, you will get nowhere. So I think this totally relative view is one that certainly needs to be overcome. At the same time, it cannot be as rigorous as we had before. Uh, secondly, uh, we think we need concepts that link the physical and the environmental risk analysis is financial, economic, and social risk. And uh, the main reason for this is that you can basically transfer risk from one to the other. You can transfer whatever the physical risk like BSE into the financial and economic sector. Most losses were there, not in the physical sector. The other way around, a lot of economic risks have been transferred not only to the taxpayer, but also to poor people, and they have suffered more than before. So they have become physical risks. And I think the idea of separating the physical from the social, from the psychological, from the economic, doesn't work anymore because they are so much interconnected that if you start to raise one, it may have repercussions on the other. And very often we have what we call amplification effect, that something starts in one area, maybe very low concern risk, but when it swaps over to the next risk domain, it becomes amplified, becomes really huge in risk. And uh, we can see this a lot with this you know, lately epidemics that we have, some of them physically not very serious, but once they reach the kind of um, public risk perception scene, they may have very strong repercussions on the economics. Uh, people just don't buy salad and and cucumber anymore, uh, as we have seen just recently. Uh, the cucumber industry collapses. Uh, we blame Spain for something that they didn't do. Uh, and we see a lot of international problems coming up from you know, just a simple accusation. So just to say, we optimize health risks may not be the right answer. Because it may be an optimization of health. So you say, well, maybe the cucumbers came from Spain. So why don't you just ban the cucumbers from Spain? Then you reduce the risk maybe by half a percent. Well, that's true. That you increase the risk of economic problems by 50 percent. And so you must, yeah, there is where trade-offs really work, uh, where you need to, to look into this to see that one domain has impact on the other domain, and we fragmentize our thinking. That's one of the problems. So we need a, a concept that does this kind of link. And then we need a concept that addresses complexity, uncertainty, and ambiguity. 
So they need different guidelines for dealing with mixtures of this kind of complexity, uncertainty, and ambiguity, and emphasize inclusive governance uh, because that's the only way to actually you know, cope with these three challenges. Now, what are premises of risk governance? Uh, first, both in quotation mark, real meaning statistical, and perceived dimension of risk are important. Um, it doesn't make much sense to say one is rational, one is irrational. It doesn't mean that one can be wrong. So people say, for example, we ask people in Germany, uh, what is your greatest food health risk? People say residues from pesticides. Now, in Germany, nobody died from pesticides. Residues. Nobody we know of. Yeah, well, maybe there's one or two, but we, we don't know. There's no statistical evidence for any of them. Well, we have a lot of evidence that people die from colibacteria, from salmonella, from all kinds of natural pathogens. But people believe that's not a real danger. If you ask them without, not in a the crisis. They say, oh, we don't know how to deal with biological risk. Our well, grandmother could do that, and our grand grandmother knew how to do this. Uh, um, that's well, that's not, a, not an issue for us. And that's not really dangerous. But all these chemical things are right there. So we can see that there are misperceptions of the world. And it would be just, in a sense, um, um, you know, idyllic to believe that people's perceptions are always right. But nevertheless, perceptions are reality. And that's what I would like to stress very much. If people believe that this risk is there or that this risk is not there, they behave accordingly. And we have a wonderful study, again, on the food sector from uh, the um, uh, from, uh, UK uh, Food Standard Agency. They looked into uh, irradiating food. And we had a lot of experiments, and it's shown that if you irradiate food, normally you can prolong the shelf life of a product. It doesn't run that quick. Now, then they did a survey among housewives in Great Britain and said, well, how do you think about you know, irradiating food? And one of the things that was very interesting in that survey was not so much that people said that's bad or risky or it kills my health. It actually wasn't that strong. But the survey showed that people said, well, you irradiate it. We know it cannot get worse. So I don't need to put it in the refrigerator. Now, in the end, if people had irradiated food for the sur for the purpose of, you know, reducing health risks, in the long run, they would have increased the health risks because people would not take the precaution that they do take now in terms of food. They would have not. They would buy whatever meat and would put it in the refrigerator, but just in normal shelf and say, oh, it can't, you know, uh, get bad because, you know, it's not ready. Um, it, of course, is not true. So what I want to say is that, you know, even the effect that you wanted to have and that you can measure physically, actually, a lot of bacteria and viruses can be killed by irradiating. If people handle that improperly, this effect is overcompensated. Yeah? And now we have something like a Jason paradox then on, on the food side. So in that sense, this is very important. Secondly, the important is governance means that we don't have just one government telling us what to do, but governance is that governing processes are jointly conducted by basically four major societal actors. That is the government and what's in there. It's a private sector, which is basically corporations and private associations. It's thirdly, the NGOs, so civil society sector, and fourthly, depending on what you're talking about, the whole issue of the knowledge systems, basically science. Uh, they are all part of the government system, and those four interact in various ways and have some impact on specific U.S. governments. Um, be focused and principled. Uh, it should be based on an inclusive ma uh, model of integrating, as I said, government, private sector, civil society, and experts. And um, it should be based on best available science, but also on very reliable and fair judgment procedures. So that is a kind of requirement. And whether you know that requirement is being met is a different issue. But uh, we came up, and when I said we, this is the International Risk Governance Council. 
It was founded in 2004 in Geneva. It's half private NGO, half being funded by various governments. And the mandate of the International Governance Council is to help risk managers, public as well as private, to deal with transboundary risk. That is basically its mandate. So the mandate is to see there are risks that are not just national and supranational. We don't have a good agency to deal with that, and therefore people need input knowledge to deal with these kind of transboundary risks. And so the IRGC has first developed this framework, this governance process that you know, underlies all its advice, and then has looked into a whole set of different things, for example, biomass conversion for energy, or now CCS, uh, or nanotechnology. So there's a whole set of different things where there are transboundary ramification uh, or repercussions, and to help risk managers, private as well as public or insurance companies to deal with these kind of global type of risks. Um, how are complex or certain ambiguity considered consider in each phase of governance? I just have to look at the, how much? Ten minutes? Okay, fine. Um, so we look at the four phases that we have. The first one we call pre-assessment. And this pre-assessment phase is one that starts before we actually look into the analysis of the risk. And what it basically means is that we look at the framing of the process. And I can only say very clearly that framing is one of the most important elements, specifically in analyzing risk debates, but also prospectively or normatively in how to design a good risk management process. Framed means there are different concepts or different perspectives that people, stakeholders, or others have about the problem at hand. So just if you, you know, I remember once went to, I think it was a big chemical company, and I said, well, I want to talk about environmental problems. And then somebody stood up and said, Dr. Wren, there are no environmental problems. We only have environmental challenges. And that was very clear what it was mean, meaning. So the frame was problems is something we don't need, but challenges are something where we can you know, stand up for. Um, so just the name, yeah, getting back to this ambiguity, uh, is sometimes very important. Uh, something is an opportunity or a risk, is an innovation or an intervention, depending on how you look at things. Uh, interesting enough, for example, if you look at fusion energy, uh, we just did a study on how people perceive fusion energy. And people who like fusion energy normally refer to it as the application of solar energy. Because it happens in the sun. So you say, well, what happens in the sun? You just replicate that on Earth, and this is solar energy on Earth. If you ask people who are against it, they say, oh, that's something like nuclear energy. It's just even more condensed. But the same real problem, we get radioactive waste, that's high energy thing, and we need high technology to do. So again, two very different frames. Um, another good example, as I said, is biomass conversion. Biomass conversion is a very interesting example, because for a long period of time, it was seen as you know, the panacea of energy policies. You know, renewable, broad works to all the farmers at least in Europe who have nothing to do, uh, overproduce food. Uh, it was seen as something that could give developmental opportunities because now subsistence farmers could also build their own energy, not only their own food. So we had all these wonderful promises. And the interesting thing was that all these promises depended on very different frames that unfortunately were not compatible. There was the United States frame, which is energy independence, what it means. You use your grain to make biofuel, and you don't want to import more energy from anybody else. Now, that was totally different from the development frame, which was saying, we provide more economic opportunities for developing countries to do palm oil and other things, and that could help them to you know, have more economic prosperity. Now, if you're on an independence or on a development frame, you do different things. If you're on a climate change frame, there's a third frame. People say, oh, you can reduce carbon emission. 
Well, if you want to do it, you have to do it on a very massive scale. Well, and then suddenly the biodiversity scale people came in and said, well, hmm, this is not so it's good for biodiversity. Um, and then, of course, there were a lot of other things that the carbon balance was not as good as people thought in the beginning. So what I want to point out is not that there are arguments back and forth. You know, what we did at IFGC, for example, we took each of the frames and said, what are the risks and the benefits seen through the glasses of that specific frame? That was quite interesting, because you could see that within the frame, you can do very good risk management. However, if you have a different frame, the same thing measures you do for one type of risk management would actually counteract the benefit of the second frame. Adding complexity and certain ambiguity, emphasis is here clearly on ambiguity, different perspectives on the problem, different perspective on institutional response, and different concepts about root of risk handling. And uh, complexity is certainly also included, I think I've made this. Uh, game. Number two is the appraisal stage. And the governance model that we propose is two different types of appraisal. So that's a kind of innovation, a risk assessment, which is the traditional assessment process, hazard identification estimation, exposure or vulnerability assessment, and a risk estimation. That's, you know. That's how it's done all the time. Well, we have added something we call concern assessment that includes the risk perception side. But we try to, do, uh, what to say, um, investigate these just as scientifically as a physical risk to see what are the socioeconomic impacts, what are types of economic or other types of benefits, and specifically what are public concerns. And only if you have both the assessment results from the physical risk and the assessment results from the concerns, we can make a prudent judgment. And again, of course, this addresses complexity, uncertainty, and ambiguity in a way that, for example, of course, uh, likelihood of societal concerns and negative perceptions are being included. That's very clearly addressing ambiguity. And complexity, uncertainty is also covered by risk assessment. Phase number three is tolerability and acceptability judgment. That is kind of how to judge whether a risk is worth taking or not. Normally, you know, we have this wonderful traffic light model, which basically says, you know, either you ban something or you need to reduce it or you can accept it. And then you can go through different stages in order to uh, move your risk candidate back and forth. Um, again, we have different ways to look into complexity, uncertainty, and ambiguity. Uh, you don't have to read it all. I'm uh, sorry, probably a little bit too much here. Um, but the evaluation thing is clear. If we have first order uncertainty, we can assign trade-offs between different risk categories and risk and benefits. If we don't do that, we have to make a qualitative judgment. Um, we need to apply societal values and norm for making judgments. The main reason for having this as a specific stage is that very often we could see in our analysis that conflicts arise either on the frames, interpretation, or on the intransparency, why a risk was seen as tolerable or not. Nobody understood the decision. So the issue of understanding a decision, why that was being made is unclear because the traditional risk model said there's an assessment and then there was management. The evaluation was somewhere in between, but nobody knew where. And at that point, of course, this invites intransparency. The last phase, risk management. Uh, there again, we can look into the need for different risk management strategies. Again, looking into routine linear risks that were said in the beginning, which is fairly easy, uh, regulating bicycles are uh, complex and moderately uncertain risks with first order uncertainty. Well, need a lot of modeling, but you can do things like cost-benefit analysis. Dealing with highly uncertain risks, risk degree of second order uncertainty, that is where you really have to go precautionary measures or, what I said, resilience-based management. And when you have highly, um, highly ambiguous risks, so people agree on the facts but don't agree on what they mean, well, you need a more discursive strategy. That's the sense where I would uh, see different types of strategies going on. I haven't covered imminent dangers or crisis. would be a different talk, but I think I talked enough already. So let me go to my conclusions. Uh, 
I'll leave out of you. I think it's better to leave, not to do everything. I can, uh, of course, we can have all the slides, but um, they always cover more than, uh, than uh, what we can handle. Um, first, problems in handling risk and uncertainties. Um, well, what kind of problems do we have? Well, we are faced with societies, plural values, plural knowledge claims. And if you have something that has a high degree of uncertainty and ambiguity, that is, I would say, just a wonderful field for all kinds of claims in society. And we have seen very good evidence that people say, well, we piggyback on the risk issue because that's the best way to get our claim. Uh, it's one good example uh, in the United States when I was there, there were syringes coming ashore from New York to the New Jersey shore, syringes from drug addicts. Now these syringes had absolutely zero risk. They were in the sea for whatever, two or three weeks. They had been assaulted in water for all the time. Even if you stepped on it and, or put it in whatever you had, it wouldn't have any impact on it. They were sterile. And nevertheless, of course, people didn't go to the shore and everything else because they felt that this was a reminder of you know bad things happening in New York. Interesting enough, Greenpeace had a big campaign and said, um, had a picture with all the syringes on the shore, and they said, do you like marine pollution? Question. Well, it had nothing to do with marine pollution. I don't know about chemicals or something. You know, they use the image, in a sense, to piggyback on something that was disgusting, and then linked it to pollution, although there was no Obviously, the chemical pollution of the sea. Now, what you could do the chemical industry as well, it's just an example. But the issue is what is important is that risk issues lend themselves to advocacy. And we can see that on all sides that this is an issue where people can easily be, you know, um, mobilized in a way that they act one way or the other. And there is a Oscillation between a relativist and a positive perspective on risk and knowledge that we see all over the place. And now we think we will be back to the positive perspective. Uh, Ten years ago, it was a relativist perspective. And both of things have their problems at that event. There's expert dissents on the degree of complexity, uncertainty, and ambiguity. Um, there's a low degree of distinction between complexity, uncertainty, and ambiguity. So everything's been mixed. And then, of course, difficult analytically to deal with this. Uh, we have a whole set of social amplification and attenuation, which is attached to how we handle these three uh, challenges and the very often inadequate methods. So that's kind of the problems that we have, and I think I covered some of them. There's also this kind of systemic risks that I did not cover, which you know, have high ambiguity, high uncertainty, high complexity, and a lot of transboundary impacts. And those are the ones that we uh, are specifically concerned about. And those there's a need for an integrated risk governance research. And uh, what we see by looking into these three different challenges separately, you know, we can develop something like risk management regimes that help us to deal with that. And if it's linear or just complex, I think risk-informed management is good. Is an expanded risk assessment. We do a lot of probability distribution analysis. We seek expert consensus and epistemic clarification, but that's it. That's fine. If we have risks that have high degree of specificity or second order uncertainty, we need the precaution resilience approach, which negotiates safety levels because we don't know how all they are under uncertainty, seeking stakeholder consensus, so we need more input and relying on containing and other types of resilience methods. And then the discourse-based management is very strongly value-based orientation, leaning towards resolving or at least handling ambiguity. And uh, there we need even more involvement by various groups in society for making sure that the interpretive variability and the normative controversy can somehow be captured. I would like to close with a quote by Bertrand Russell. Uh, what man desires is not knowledge but certainty. Interesting quote. At that time, you could only say man. Today, we are more politically correct. You could say what human desire. Um, and I think, you know, that is kind of my personal uh, point of it. We cannot produce certainty. Uh, you know, 
a lot of people lie that as scientists or as risk managers to produce certainty. We're not able to do that, actually. The more we know, the more we find out how uncertain our knowledge is. Uh, but we can help people to develop coping mechanisms to deal prudently with the necessary uncertainty that's required for societies to change. Thank you very much. Before we start the discussion, I would ask the first to ask Coco Wanna to give up the openness of this discussion for first comment. You can sit, you can come to the front, but you prefer. Thanks very much. Professor Rand, it's really always a pleasure to hear you speak. And I think that your work and the work of the network that you've influenced has had tremendous um, resonance and influence on a whole generation of researchers. So thanks very much. Um, including Joanne Lunar and Bayer, who's my first boss. We work very, very closely together. Um, my name is Coco Warner. I work at the United Nations University, and it's great that we're here um, among colleagues. We had a chance to work with Seth on various research projects, um, along with a, a kind of cohort of researchers here in Bonn. I wanted to um, just reflect a little bit on some of the things which mm -hmm. Professor Wren was bringing up and reflect on why it's so important for our research, the role of science, as well as the policy world. Um, part of what United Nations University does, as I said, we work with CEF on a variety of research projects, which are quite important for research in academia. But as a United Nations organization, we also have a chance, together with BIC and others, um, to bring that knowledge to the policy sphere. And one of those policy spheres is the UN um, framework on climate change. So UNFCCC is also a neighbor just down um, the road. And I just wanted to reflect on a couple of things, um, as well as our research, which you mentioned. Some of you may be following the climate negotiations. Um, we just concluded a recent session in Bonn, and the press coverage wasn't very good. And there were all sorts of things going on um, behind the scenes. The chairs of, of two of the four subcommittees had set up the agenda so they were essentially designed to fail. They knew that a group of countries, particularly one country, would take issue at the way the agenda was put together. And you're thinking, what does this have to do with risk governance? Um, so we spent two weeks talking about agenda and agenda setting. And for the person on the street, you think, are you serious? You're, not, you're going nowhere fast. In the meantime, scientists um, are, are giving messages like, you, you would, have, would have also heard this spring, that in order to, that 2011, for example, was the highest emissions year of greenhouse gas emissions on record. You may have, um, in recent weeks, read the executive summary or maybe even read the report for the Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program, which came out with a new study um, looking at glacial melt on areas like Greenland. And some of their findings were that now we understand glacial melt a little bit better than we did back in 2005, 2006, 2007, when the IPCC's fourth assessment report came out. What they said is, based on our current knowledge of glacial melt, we think we actually under underestimated the levels of sea level by about, I mean, the difference was 7 to 21 inches. So there's 7 inches, there's 21 inches. That's what the fourth assessment report estimated. And now, if our current understanding of these very dynamic systems is a little bit more accurate, now we're looking at between 60 centimeters, which I think is up to my knee, to almost, you know, how tall am I? Maybe hmm, like 150 <laughs> centimeters or 160 centimeters. It's quite a difference. That's a whole person, a small person, but that's a whole person's difference um, in terms of sea level rise. Why does that matter? Well, first of all, a lot of that sea level rise is really complex. The kind of complexity which you were explaining is, is very typical of some of the natural systems and their inter interactions with human society. Why does it matter? We probably, in our lifetimes, aren't going to experience too much of this. So that kind of sea level rise, we're expecting out to mid-century or even like towards the end of the century. One of my favorite NGO t-shirts um, walking around the, the halls of the climate negotiations is in um, front it says, how old will you be in 2050? Have any of you thought about how old you will be in 2050? 
I heard the questions the first time I ever thought that far ahead in my life. And I actually had to think, wow, I'm actually going to be pretty old at that time. <laughs> and um, my children are going to be older than I am right now in 2050. And so then you think, well, it, why does it matter so far ahead? And this, um, maybe my thoughts are less coherent than yours. No. Um, but it starts mattering um, for a variety of reasons. One, because we are in what geologists are calling the age of the Anthropocene. We live in systems which are so huge that we as humans have a really hard time perceiving why my driving SUV, I don't drive an SUV, I sold my car, I only drive a bike, but why my lifestyle, which is relatively energy intensive, and even more so in the United States where I'm from, affects glacial melt in Greenland, which in turn affects human displacement out in the South Pacific. My colleague, um, Cosmin Corande, is an expert in human displacement in the South Pacific. What does all of that have to do with each other? It's a huge system, and it's really hard to see how all of that interacts. We live in an enormous but enclosed system. Our actions matter. Our actions individually matter, especially when you consider that people do things purposefully and systematically. So back to the age of the Anthropocene. Geologists, which are a very hard crowd, they're very tough to convince, but geologists have, for a long time, recognized that our human organized systems are leaving a record in the geologic record, in rocks. If you look at pollen histories, we're starting, instead of seeing rich, biologically diverse pollen histories, in layers of rocks, geologists are now saying, in 10,000 years from now, when scientists, if scientists are around then, when they look back at our rock history, they will see not multitudes of pollen, but they'll see wide swaths of soy, corn, wheat, rice, reflecting our agricultural practices today. And that's probably been going on now for a few thousand years since we became an agricultural species and on and on, but we shape our world and we do so systematically. One of the reasons why I found Professor Brown's comments so compelling is that there is so much uncertainty and we do things as a human race so systematically that it is very much in our power to shape or annihilate the world that we live in. Now that annihilate, that's a very strong word. And here comes in science. Science now, faces huge uncertainty. And climate scientists are doing their best to model, but there are broad ranges of uncertainty around all of this. And then it comes in with policy. So you have science saying, hey guys, if we keep going this way, the physics suggests that we'll have this kind of temperature change on average globally. And around the physics, there's the most certainty. Those are things that can be re uh, kind of reproduced. But what we're not certain about is how our human systems and the very complex natural systems interact with those changes in temperature. But we know that life is based on water, and we know how water reacts to temperature. So we have an idea, but not a certain idea by any means, about how our living Earth, the only thing that we have in this entire universe, interacts with temperature. But beyond that, there's huge uncertainty. And the reason it matters so much is because we shape our world. And we're certainly shaping what's coming down the line, but we don't know. So fast forward, or just go back to the halls of the climate negotiations, you've got nation states who on the one hand have vested interests, and they'll have a perspective such as you have described. If you can't prove it to me scientifically, and attribution is a big debate, um, if you can't prove it to me scientifically, why should I change? One of the countries that was really um, concerned about agenda shaping in, in June in the Bonn climate talks was Saudi Arabia, and you can understand why. Saudi Arabia could have a lot to lose from the climate negotiations. Burning oil and fossil fuels is right now, scientifically, one of the culprits of changing greenhouse gas concentrations, and that's linked scientifically to global temperatures. But political interests say, look, you know, if you can't prove it to me, why should I change? And then you've got a bunch of rich countries that love to burn rocks, like the United States or any number of industrialized countries, including emerging economies, China, India, South Africa, Brazil. And they say, you know, if, if you could prove it to me 
how much my burning this set of rocks or fossil fuels or whatever contributes to greenhouse emissions, then I might change or then I might pay. But unless you can prove that scientifically, why should I change? And so we're going through these really complex systems where we know we're changing things, but where science doesn't provide some answers, um, and it's really fascinating and it really matters. I wanted maybe to speak less than that, so I should leave it at that. Maybe the, the last comment that I wanted to, um, to bring out is you mentioned that perceptions are reality, and we see that. We see that in our research. For example, um, Dr. Tom Rafifi, who's here, um, is leading a research project um, that I get to work with him at United Nations University on environmental changes and human migration. And what we're finding is um, there are a multitude of factors that play a role in why people move from one place to another, but perception is reality. And whether or not people actually experience the kinds of changes that they think they might, they act today based on the risks that they perceive in the future. Migration is one of those things, um, and there are a variety of other things. So I just wanted to say it's a great talk, very stimulating, and it really matters in the world of policy and science. Thanks very much. So the floor is uh, uh, open for questions coming from your side. Let's start. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I just talked a lot, but yeah. given so much uncertainty, your last couple of slides emphasized what do we do about it. Yeah. But the what do we do isn't for your values. Absolutely. I think that the idea, well, I think there are two aspects to this, and I'm also very, you know, happy the way that you developed um, the sort of that that even if we have uncertainty, doesn't mean we should not act. Um, we always act under the assumption of uncertainty. If we buy a new dress, if we buy new shoes, we're not quite sure whether we like it in half a year, or whether we live in a car, we're not quite sure, you know, or even a bicycle, whatever it is, there's always the uncertainty that something happens. Still, we do bicycle, we do buy shoes, and we do all kinds of other things. The reason is because we believe that we can deal with that kind of uncertainty. We can either bring the shoes back, or we can say, well, maybe the next pair will do better. Um, there are different possibilities to cope with that. And, and I think when we talk about these things like Earth Systems Analysis, where we don't have a lot of alternatives, um, my response always to people is say, well, we need full evidence. I say, well, if you turn it around, uh, let's say we only have 80% evidence. Now, if you take 80% times the maximum loss that this will have, would you be able to be responsible? Would you take that that is acceptable? Even if it's only 5%, as I said before. Uh, you know, take 5% times the maximum loss. That's still a big, huge number. Uh, so, depending on, you know, it's again, it's a framing issue. So if you take the frame as I want to have 100% certainty for it, or I want to have enough certainty that acting is better than not acting. It's a very different frame. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this is all linked with strategic action. And people lose more by acting in all the coal industry, certainly about one half to hundred percent. But I think that's where science, but also where you know policy makers, NGOs, and media have a role to play if they can say what are the consequences of having that kind of attitude. Um, and that is, I think, it's one of the issues that we deal with also on educational level. Mm -hmm. That you know, very little, very little in the world is absolutely certain. And if we wait for things to become certain, we'll wait forever. We're going to be dead. Uh, so we have to deal with uncertainty. And if the uncertainty it has a very high price tag to it, then it's even more important to use issues of resilience, robustness, that help us to say, well, if it turns out worse than we assume, we're still not totally prepared. Mm -hmm. If it turns out better, we can also look to no regret measures, and we have other kind of fringe benefits that come out of this. And, and I think these kind of coping strategies are 
can be very powerful, um, even in situations where uh, people have strategic interests to counteract. Uh, very often, you have to, to find some kind of plausibility for those who don't want to move, but you can get them moved if they're convinced. So, yes, the issue is if there is uncertainty, there's just no excuse for not doing something. Even as uncertainty is still high. I got a question. The, the subtitle of your book is Coping with Uncertainty in a Complex World. Yeah. So, this directly. Uh, was the question of, was there any time a world which was less complex? So the yeah. question is, is there more of a, a change over time in our perception of, uh, of risk and of the, of the growing of uncertainty? On the one hand, you can say, okay, the whole production, the industries yeah. of knowledge uh, is uh, growing, we get more knowledge, so it's the one that more uncertainty. Is this the reason? Or perhaps you can also say, I mean, uh, 150 years ago, the framing was a completely different one. You had a much stronger belief in a, uh, in a Christian yeah, yeah. opportunity and these things, which were more or less, much stronger uh, uh, frames than we get to today. Yeah. Well, I think both both things are true. I mean, one of the things I, I made a very strong plea in there that we are, you know, just for philosophical reasons to avoid a whole lot of philosophical debate, that we're talking about knowledge as a main point, which is, you know, always a representation of reality, not reality. And that helps us a lot. And you know, we say, well, we look into representations of reality because we have no more knowledge, and also because we have the power to intervene more into the reality. We see the world now as more complex than they have been before. Now, the natural laws or whatever, or the natural system out there has been as complex as ever. I mean, that's yeah. not an issue. First, our knowledge has increased, so we can see more of the complexity. And secondly, we intervene more, so that our interventions relate to more responses in the natural world that may be different from what we've seen in the past, where normally kind of natural um, changes, unless you know the volcano or break it down or something, but normally things go slow. And, and I think that's the main difference in terms of um, biological evolution, cultural evolution is time. Uh, you know, biological evolution takes time, takes a lot of time, so that the time for adjusting is there. Now, with cultural evolution, we don't have the time, and we change things very dramatically before we can really adjust it to its consequences. And I think that's, that's a point where the issue of risk management becomes so prominent that you say, well, because we don't want to wait until adjustment comes in, and you know, we change the system you know, by doing it and, and adjusting it at the same time. Uh, that makes it so important to anticipate consequences. Okay. Yeah. I have a question concerning emergence. I mean, how does a risk emerge? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about perception and reality. The question is, that's already when a risk has been perceived or when yeah. it's on the agenda. How does a risk form? I mean, how, how can one really to get also those sort of subaltern people into into view when yeah. they see risks. I mean. Yeah. Well, basically, I mean, you can say, well, there are two different types of signals that we absorb. One signal is that we observe the world, and if something happens that we don't expect, uh, we'll tr try to ask ourselves what are the reasons for these kind of unexpected Maybe they're expected, but we still try to want to find the reasons. But if it's unexpected, it's even more so. So that sense observation of, let's say, experienced harm is certainly one way to look into risk. And, and a lot of kind of also common sense uh, risk situations are, uh, you know, you observe seven people riding bicycles, two of them fall down, and you can see keeping the balance is a really important issue for risk management. The second point, more important, is communicative signal. And communicative signals are signals that other people tell you about a potential threat and what to do to, to combat it. And that has, of course, this hypotheticality behind it that makes it sometimes very difficult to respond to it because you don't observe it. I mean, if you take the ozone layer, a good example, nobody observed the ozone layer. Take BSE, nobody could smell it, nobody could taste it, nobody could see it, yet there was a claim that people were getting sick. Nobody had seen anyone being sick, at least in Germany. We don't have any 
case, as far as we know. Um, yet it was still a threat. So this is something where you have a hypothetical threat, and you never know whether the risk would have really had any harm if you, for example, change the cause, and that potential damage doesn't happen. And that's why we say risk is certainly a social construct, because it may never materialize. Um, and so the two things, of course, interact. You know, just like with any kind of science, we have a very theoretical physicists and we have experimental physicists. In you know, somehow we need to bring the two parts together. It's the same thing with social science. We have people with maybe some theoretical in, um, insights into what could have damaging effect in the future and why, and model this and try to put this. But at the same time, we need empirical results to show whether that or can somehow be proven. But proven in the risk sense means not that there is 100% certainty. And that makes it so difficult sometimes to communicate it. Uh, or that, as we said before, about you know, migration, that all kinds of perceptions that potentially future impacts have a strong driving force towards behavior. And one of my own hypotheses is the more virtual this is, the stronger is emotion. I mean, it's somehow ridiculous that people buy um, Geiger counters and um, uh, you know medical devices against radiation in Germany after the Fukushima accident. And most Japanese did not. Um, and you know, the further away you are from something, the more virtually you can imagine something, mm -hmm. the more room is there mm -hmm. for kind of all kinds of notions. Uh, and and uh, and you'll see that in, 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 in several issues. If you really face a danger, if you really face something out there, most people turn to be out quite rational. Uh, don't panic. Don't panic. There are a lot of conditions before people panic. Uh, but if you have a movie that tells you, you know, and then it's right, you know, 10,000 kilometers away, uh, you can afford to pay. Um, and that's a psychological uh, aspect. And we can see that, you know, in a country like Germany, we don't have a lot of hazards. Neither natural hazards nor other types of hazards. People are getting older and safer every year. Uh, the perception is totally different. And that makes it sometimes so difficult, I mean, to deal with these types of risks because the risk perception arena is a different one, it's a virtual one. Rather than uh, you know the damage, the real damage, and uh, and sometimes people don't understand the difference between the virtual and the real. I mean, climate change is a good thing. I mean, they all have seen all the animations, but they don't believe it's happening in their backyard. Mm -hmm. um, in this world of uncertainties, uh, how does one take responsibility of a policy? Uh, you know that one has arrived at. For instance. Um, there's a scientific research based on perceptions of this mm -hmm. and that, but such perceptions in itself is also uncertainty. So at the end of the day, you conclude based on some perceptions, and then an institution is taking decisions based on these uh, conclusions. At the end of the day, it works fine. If it doesn't work, you just end up saying, you know, it's based on some uncertainty. That's why you arrive at that decision. How does that institution be held responsible for taking decisions in this complex world of uncertainties? Yeah, very, very important question. I mean, the thing is that in risk policies, it's very difficult to verify that you've done the right thing. If you have avoided a risk that never happens, people say, well, it was never there. Let's assume we were very successful in climate policies, or very successful in ozone layer. Actually, it, it does you know, seem to get better. People will say, well, you said there was a risk, we've never seen it. We put a lot of money into it and nothing happened. But that's a difficult situation. I mean, you, maybe if you didn't do anything, it would have been a real bad incident. However, if, if you avoid a risk with a lot of resources invested, um, you risk that people will say you based all the money because nothing happened. Um, on the other hand, if you let it happen and the 
say, well, now, and they say, well, I knew this already three years before, but I didn't do anything because we wanted first to see, you know, the bad things happening, because otherwise you won't give us a license to do anything. Well, this is the last year you're going to be a politician. Um, so that that is a problem. And I think this is also an issue of, I think, science education, or let's better say science communication, or risk communication, to say, look, people, we work all on models, or whether it's intuitive models or other kinds of things. And all our anticipation of what we're doing is based on past experience, but since times are changing so quickly, we deal with models. And it could be that we have a wrong model and we do the wrong thing. But if we don't do anything, this is disaster. So again, we're getting back to this probabilistic thinking is sometimes you know difficult. You can say, well, you know, even if there's only five percent probability that my model is right, but it is a total disaster if I'm right. That was the financial crisis was exactly that. I mean, we had a ninety-five percent value at risk thing. And all the corporations said five percent who cares. Well, if you multiply the 5% with the whole financial market, it's enough to have a domino effect. So the, the calculations were wrong. It's a conclusion you draw through this. And I think that's the same thing in climate change where we have much higher probabilities. Now, if you had a probability of 95% or 98% that a nuclear power reactor would explode, um, well, nobody would use that anymore. If you have a 95% probability that they have sea level rise, which you just said, and dramatically, and then somebody says, well, there's still 5% that it won't happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it's, you know, uh, yes, you can respond that way, but it's totally not prudent. And I think we have to make kind of an educational or communicational effort to help people dealing with uncertainty and telling them, coming back to your question, that you know, we always act upon uncertainty. We don't call it, but we do. And very often, he might be wrong, so it's very good to, to be, you know, um, to have a learning system that is reflexive enough that you can replace your one policy with another. If it, but you cannot help to act on uncertain events as if they were certain. Because otherwise, one of these uncertain events will definitely come true. You mentioned resilient-based management approaches would be maybe one solution to to, yeah. to uh, face uncertainty. Yeah. What does this have for uh, implications for risk assessment? Because I have a feeling that most risk assessments which are conducted are more the hazard side, yeah. and then maybe some exposure elements. Yeah. But we are doing which as we study vulnerability and to see the underlying factors that cause yeah. them harm, and does not only focus on the cause effect relationship, but really on the underlying factors. Yeah. And focusing on these, also the assessment procedures, could help to identify continuously um, weaknesses in the human or social system yeah. that might occur uh, if a certain event takes place. So. Um, I have the feeling that uh, conceptually, a risk assessment is not sufficient, uh, vulnerability is not sufficiently recognized. Yeah. And that's, that's to some extent also found in your book. Yeah. yeah. Because it's always mentioned conceptually mm -hmm. or, or theoretically, but it's not operationalized really. And how this is linked then to risk management, where I would say vulnerability management, yeah. and not hazard control or something like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're right. I mean, in, in the terms of risk, I mean, we normally assume that we have, you know, two equally important elements. One is the hazard and its, you know, outbreak, and the risk of the whole system, which is either vulnerable or not, or to a specific degree vulnerable. And normally, we can say we can go both sides. We can either reduce the hazard, if it is possible, or we increase the resilience as a vulnerable system. Those are two possibilities. And what I can see, and I think I get your point, and I think it's, it's well taken, that in the book, I've given both consideration, and I think in many contexts, looking more into the risk-absorbing system than to the hazard system is much more promising. Specifically, they have high uncertainty about the hazards, or if the hazards are unavoidable. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, a lot of natural hazards are unavoidable. I mean, earthquakes is something where, you know, 
you know, act of God, but you know, maybe prayer helps, but that's a different question. But in a sense, it's there, you cannot, um, you know, at least manipulate. So then you only deal with Roman and because it has a side of space. <coughs> On the technological side, it's different. Very often, it may be easier to reduce the hazard than to increase the resilience of the system. I mean, take nuclear power, good example, you know, in Germany, uh, well, I mean, resilient the system and better evacuation plans, uh, uh, make sure that uh, whatever um, the people uh, have enough drugs to uh, protect themselves against uh, iodine or something, um, uh, iodine pills as well. This is, um, you know, and there you say, well, you better reduce the hazard. Um, so I think it depends on the context whether you take the one side or the other side. But you're right, and I think it has been voiced several times, that the vulnerability analysis also in the book is not as well covered. And the part of this is, is there's still a lot of things to do. I think we have traditionally be more focused on the hazard side than on the vulnerability resilience. Any other question? And I would just take a question for curiosity. I was last weekend in London and yeah. in preparation for the presentation today, I just went to uh, Blackwell and did a nice shelf on risk books yeah. on risk from your book. But uh, the most of the books I found there were from the economics. Yeah. So it's a very concentration economics, rarely in ecological science. Yeah. So why it is the way that, especially in economics, the risk is such a, such a, that's only discussed and not in other, uh, so much, not so much in other uh, disciplines. Well, I think the, the main reason is that, you know, um, uh, you know, economy has a very short time scale in terms of payoffs or risks. I mean, if you talk about geological um, time, you know, you talk about 10 million or more years, um, that's too long for people to wait until the risk will arise. Um, now, in economics, you know, if you had the predictability of one day, you would be billionaire. You, know, you would be able to predict the stock market for a day with high accuracy, and that would be well. So, in a sense, Economic decisions are, because of the very t short time frame, always decisions under risk. And there may be less decisions under uncertainty in a way that if you have short term ones, you know, we have fairly good model of how things might develop. Mm -hmm. And you can more general use the usual uh, type of probability theory that doesn't tell you about your specific stock, but it tells you maybe something about your whole stock market. We have whole portfolio theories and everything else that help you to make wise investments over time. Um, in that sense, is that you know any type of financial investment is inadvertently associated with some kind of risk management strategy. Um, and if you look into too many other areas, like the physical health area, you know, look in cancer, you have latency periods maybe 10 to 12 years. Mm -hmm. So if people smoke today, they're going to get their cancer maybe in 12, 15, or 20 years. Uh, so the time frame is different. Okay. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important in economics to, you know, to focus on risk. And it's so obvious. Yeah. It's, with smoking, it's not so obvious. You tell a person who smokes, a young person, to start smoking, but uh, you're going to get lung cancer in your 40s. said, well, that's a long time to go. And I'm not smoke. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Thank yeah. you for this fascinating presentation. I think you all learned a lot. And uh, I think if you want to, uh, uh, for, uh, to again, to go back to this presentation, think about the presentation, we have it also on our web. In, uh, we uh, let's make a streamline for our web page so that you can see it again or uh, forward it to your friends or other colleagues. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope we'll see you back soon and discuss this issue uh, again. <coughs> that we are definitely are thinking to deal much more with this question of uncertainty and risk in future. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah.